I've been given the chance to, uh, to talk about a clinical trial that we're doing now. Um, those of you at Emory may have uh, helped to uh, take care of some of the patients in this trial. Um, and um, I, I need to uh, disclose that, um, uh, well, my disclosures are up over here, but the, the funding for the clinical trial I'm going to uh, talk about was given by the Marcus Foundation. So I want to briefly start out reminding people what our usual treatment for patients with sepsis is, and then talk a little bit about what types of trials should change practice, what types of things should make you do something differently, and then uh, spend a few minutes talking about the evidence supporting the use, the evidence that led to us doing this trial, and then finally to describe the design of this trial. And uh, I'd like to start out with a patient. And this is somebody who about a year and a half ago we took care of in the 5T North ICU at Emory. Um, a, uh, a person who had had a bone marrow transplant for CML. Um, he was initially admitted with uh, GVHD with GI symptoms and then uh, presented uh, to our ICU with tachypnea, um, uh, leukopenia, um, and had uh, pseudomonas in his bloodstream. Um, so, he, he had an infection. Um, he uh, was transferred to the ICU when he uh, required a non-rebreather, so he has organ failure, and he meets the criteria for sepsis. And I think that most people would be comfortable saying that sepsis is a medical emergency. Um, that uh, uh, you'll hear later on uh, today from Manny Rivers, who's really the person who, who highlighted this concept, that, um, that we ought to treat patients the same way that we treat patients with acute MIs, um, with trauma, and with strokes. And it's common. Um, we see it uh, frequently in the ICU or in the emergency room, um, and it's life-threatening. Um, it's the most common cause of death for people who are admitted to U.S. hospitals. And we know now that there's a time to therapy um, uh, requirement that the sooner you treat somebody with sepsis, the better that they do, especially giving antibiotics. And really, when we think about the treatments that we have, there are a couple of useful things in our, in our toolbox, if you will. Um, the first of them is recognizing patients with sepsis. And at least for me, this is the hardest part. We don't have a biomarker. There are a lot of mimics for sepsis. And there are a lot of people who might have sepsis or have the same uh, symptoms, but in fact have something other than sepsis. We know that early antibiotics and fluids are important. And finally, many hospitals now, uh, because of the new CMS mandate, are involved with performance improvement projects. And we know that, that if you measure how well you're doing and standardize how you do and then give that feedback, in fact, patients tend to do better. So here's the first question, and hopefully it won't be too much of a challenge. Um, so which of the following are true statements about sepsis? Um, sepsis is a medical emergency, time to antibiotics is associated with patient mortality, and sepsis is a wrong statement, uh, is, a, is a rare syndrome. And the one and two, or one, two, and three. Well, it looks as though uh, this was not too much of a challenge, and most of you have uh, um, uh, a, uh, um, enough caffeine in there. Um, so I, I seem to have locked the poll a little bit early, and we'll move on. I, I should point out that uh, while I don't know how many people answered that, but in fact, time to therapy, time to antibiotics is associated with mortality. So I talked for a couple minutes about things that are in our sepsis toolbox, but there are a lot of things that are not useful in sepsis. Um, and there have been a huge number of randomized controlled trials um, that have not shown a beneficial treatment effect. And I would hope to show them to you, at least five or six of them, um, but the slides do not seem to be advancing right now. Um, there we go. Thank you. And these are, again, a couple of trials that have been published in the last 10 years. Um, and 
none of these have led to uh, improvements in, in patient outcomes. So when um, a, a very uh, charismatic physician from, um, from Virginia stated that he had cured sepsis by giving um, a triple therapy, vitamin C, thiamine, and steroids to patients with sepsis, it, it got a lot of press. Um, it was in newspapers, it was on the radio, it was on television. And he started doing this because he had a very sick patient and they weren't doing well and he sort of reached deep into his, his, uh, his white coat and, and came up with a couple of things with, that other people had used and put them together. The patient did well and then he proceeded to do the same thing for the next 79 patients. And he showed a huge treatment effect. The mortality compared with historical controls that were matched, which the mortality in the historical controls was 40%, and the mortality from the, the patients that he uh, published was 8%. So it cut mortality by 32%, which is a tremendous treatment effect, a tremendous treatment effect. And there's, there's very little in medicine that, that has such a large treatment effect. And, um, the reason that he tried it again was that there were a couple of small studies, uh, one that, that I'm showing here uh, by, um, by Barry Fowler at, at, from another Virginia institution in which he gave a small number of patients um, vitamin C at either uh, small or, or medium-sized doses and uh, looked at what happened to their uh, SOFA scores, which is a measure of uh, organ failure. and um, what this uh, the slide shows is that if you give um, vitamin C, you will raise your vitamin C levels, which you'd expect. If you give more vitamin C, your vitamin C levels will go higher. And with that, there is a dose-dependent drop in, in uh, your uh, SOFA score, um, suggesting that in this tiny study that there might be rationale for doing this. So that was part of the pr uh, preliminary data that led to Paul Marek doing this. Um, patients with sepsis also have low levels of vitamin C, they have low levels of simon, and some small studies have showed that you can give these to patients without obvious harm. And there may be some synergistic effect of steroids and vitamin C. So again, he did this study, it got a lot of press, and at his hospital, he started using this. And he strongly encouraged other people to use this because it was cheap and it probably, he said, wasn't harmful. Um, we usually don't change practice because of a single center before and after study. At least we usually don't change practice at other hospitals. When you do performance improvement projects, sometimes you'll change practice at your own hospital because you'll try something, it will work in your hospital, and you'll say, I'll do it. So it makes perfect sense at his hospital that he does it, but not so much at other hospitals because you might have different practices, different patients. Um, it's a complex intervention, so we don't know which of these three drugs that he gave, vitamin C, thiamine, or steroids, works. Um, and we have little information about how the patients were treated other than the, the triple therapy. And again, there was a huge effect size. So if you want to know if there's ever been a study that has shown a large effect size like this, well, there is. There, there's actually a before and after trial um, from over 50 years ago from the University of Pennsylvania when Austrian and Gold published their experience um, with giving first serum and then antibiotics for patients with pneumococcal bacteremia. So, um, when you, give, uh, when you don't give antibiotics for pneumococcal bacteremia, and back in the 1930s and 40s, the pre-antibiotic age, we, people didn't have antibiotics, and 90% of patients with pneumococcal bacteremia died. If you gave convalescent serum from people who had survived this to people with pneumococcal bacteremia, there was a 38% absolute risk reduction in mortality. So that seemed to help patient compared with not treating them. And when you gave penicillin, which back then was the treatment for pneumococcal bacteremia, again, there was a large treatment effect. So this is a before and after study that probably changed the treatment of infections. 
Um, but that's the only other study that I, that I know of that has shown such a large treatment effect. So again, generally, the advantage of doing single center trials is that you can test whether something works in your hospital. And, and that's an important thing to know. Does something work for your patients? Um, it's easier to do a single center trial than it is to do a multi-center trial. It's cheaper. Um, and again, if something works at your site, it makes perfect sense to use it at your site. Um, you also may see a large treatment effect. Usually to change practice, we do a, a phase three or sometimes several phase three clinical trials. And they're harder to do, they're more expensive, um, they take more time, but this is really the gold standard for changing clinical practice. And the treatment effects in multi-center trials, because they're different patients with different treatments, tend to be much smaller than in single center trials. Which leads me to the second question that I have. Um, so which of the following statements are false? Um, single center clinical trials usually change clinical practice. Single center clinical trials are simpler to do than multi-center trials. And a multi-center trial is more expensive to perform than a single center trial. Should I move on to the next slide or I, I wait and see? Okay. So we seem to have plateaued, um, and um, uh, I would, uh, would say that um, uh, perhaps I have not done the best job of, of uh, waking you up in the morning, um, <laughs> which I apologize for. Um, and so uh, usually a multi-center uh, clinical trial will change clinical practice. Um, so it is easier to do a, a, a single center trial. Oh, thank you. I feel, I feel a little bit better that 100% uh, that of the people did not get the question wrong. <laughs> I probably would have been the last talk that I ever gave if, uh, if, if that happened. Um, so I, I want to end this talk um, with, with a, a brief description of the Victus trial. And those of you who work either at uh, Clifton Road, at Grady, or at Emory St. Joe's uh, may have taken care of one of these patients. So we're studying adult patients with sepsis who either have respiratory or cardiovascular organ dysfunction. Um, and are in, we're studying them within the first 24 hours of developing the organ dysfunction. And our intervention is either vitamin C, thymine, and hydrocortisone, or placebo. Um, we're giving it for four days or until the patient leaves the ICU, and our comparator is placebo unless the clinical team decides that they want to give steroids, in which case we allow people to get steroids because some people feel strongly that steroids are useful in septic shock, um, which means that we may bias the trial towards the null if steroids are the important thing in treating patients. And we're looking at speed of recovery, vasopressor and ventilator-free days, and also um, a 30-day mortality. Um, adult patients, again, with either respiratory or cardiovascular dysfunction. And it's designed to be a pragmatic trial um, so that we, uh, there are relatively few exclusion criteria. If somebody's really sick from sepsis, we enroll them even if we think they're likely going to die. So we've got 43 enrolling sites. This is just a list of the, uh, the, the, the sites across the US. Um, 34 of them are actively enrolling, and we're bringing up the, um, the, the remaining nine uh, sites. Some of you may be aware there was a thymine shortage that, uh, that delayed our ability to, to bring more sites on, on board. Um, and uh, we are now, this is uh, now, I had to submit these slides a couple weeks ago, um, so we're up to 267 patients and recruitment is going nicely. Um, so I appreciate your attention um, and uh, thank you for, uh, for allowing me to present uh, the Victus trial.
So the, the, the question, is, so it's a wonderful question, and it was if somebody is randomized to the treatment arm that has uh, vitamin C, thiamine, and steroids, do we continue them on steroids uh, for the full four days or until the, they leave the ICU? And the answer is yes. Um, if somebody is getting wild-type steroids because the teen decides they want to give that, we, we drop the third uh, uh, arm of, of the, the, the third drug, which is either the steroids or the placebo, and then they get it for as long as the team wants it to. But, but if you get randomized to, to the intervention arm, we continue with the steroids all the way, all the way through. Yes, Mike. So it's been, what, two years since Merrick published the article, <coughs> probably three years since we collected all the data. Has there been any updates from his hospital about is this impressive survival rate? Is that still continuing to this day? So, uh, so the question is, well, what is, what is the ex experience at, at Virginia Commonwealth uh, University? Um, and sorry, he's, not, he's at East Virginia Medical Center. Um, and they have given vitamin C, thiamine, and steroids to over 800 patients. Um, they talk about how they've given it to 800 patients, but they have not published the mortality in that group. So. Um, I can't, I can't tell you what their experience is. Um, there have also been, as at last count, there were nine ongoing or planned trials uh, across the world um, in this, and um, none of them have uh, been published. Barry Fowler um, has a manuscript in review right now on about 160 patients just with vitamin C. Um, and uh, he's presented that data suggesting that vitamin C alone may prevent organ failure um, in patients at risk for lung injury. Um, but, but that has, it's, again, it's, it's undergoing peer review right now. So that's it's another wonderful question, and it was uh, for other forms of shock, like vasoplegia, um, is, is this useful? Um, there are a number of people interested in it. The Australian New Zealand Clinical Trials Group uh, has a 100-patient uh, a, a study that they're current, a pilot study that they're currently doing in patients with vasoplegic shock uh, post-cardiopulmonary bypass. Um, but they, they've just started the study, and they, they, haven't, uh, they haven't published any of their data other than saying protocol. That, that's the only one I'm aware of. So, the, so the, 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 the question is why people have used much larger doses of vitamin C and why are we not using larger doses of vitamin C? And again, that's another wonderful question. Um, the reason that we're studying this particular dose is that when people are using this and roughly, and, and this, is, this is not firm data, but, but about a quarter of the uh, clinicians that, that some of us have surveyed in the U.S are using this drug, this drug cocktail at this dose in their patients. So, um, so you want to, if you're going to study something, you want to study what people are using. Um, whether this is the best dose is hard to tell, right? And we, uh, uh, we have a collaborator at NIH by the name of Mark, uh, Mark Levine, who's the, the US expert on vitamin C. He's responsible for the daily requirements for vitamin C and is 
um, and he's going to be measuring vitamin C levels and vitamin C metabolism so we can get some sense of, um, of what, uh, at least what's happening in our patients. But I can't tell you if the drugs, if the cocktail works. I can't tell you that there isn't a better dose, whether that's higher or lower, but, but you have to start somewhere. And this is the, we're starting here because this is the dose that people are using.